Hello, I'm Pastor Myron Jenkins, the pastor of Newton County and Greater Atlanta Seventh-day Adventist Church. I would like to welcome all of our members, and I would like to welcome all of you who have joined us this Sabbath day. I want to say something special, and that is, this day is special. God created it, and he hallowed it, he blessed it, and sanctified it. So I anticipate that you will have a worship experience today. So before we go any further, I would like to ask God to come in and bless us on this Sabbath day. Let us pray. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being the sovereign God that you are. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit into this service today that when we leave, we'll be able to say, surely we have been in the presence of the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. I'm so glad that you took the time out to join with us today and worship on this Sabbath day. I don't know what situation you're in right now. I don't know what you've gone through this week. But I want to assure you of one thing, that God is real. And there's something that a lot of people find themselves wondering. Some folks say, I've lost loved ones in this crisis situation. And others say, we've been blessed not to get the virus. Where is God in the midst of these two dilemmas? Well, I want to say this. God loves us all. And it's not God who has put these diseases on us and it causes these diseases to happen. And, and it's not God who sits and says, this one will live and this one will die. He doesn't take a, a toll as far as saying, you look so good or you have this much money. It's because of sin. But I want to let you know today that if you have a loved one or if you unfortunately find yourself in a situation where you catch this disease, God has promised each and every one of us that if you give your life to him and if you recognize him as the son of God, that he said in St. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if by chance you have a loved one or you know of a friend who's lost their life in this fight, if their lives are connected with Jesus Christ, I want to let you know that God is going to give them a life He's going to give them a body. He's going to give them something so much more beautiful than they've ever, ever experienced before. And they'll have a body where they won't have to experience no more sin, no more death, and no more sorrow. So today we just ask and pray to God today to give us the strength to endure and to continue to have that faith in God and regardless on what side of the fence you may find yourself on, God is God, and he's God all by himself, and he still deserves all the honor, the glory, and the praise. We can put our trust still in God today in the midst of this storm. Today, I, before I start, I'm going to have a word of prayer, um, but today's topic is entitled, partnering with the promises of God. And that's found in the scripture we'll be using this morning is Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. Let us pray. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, we thank you for being the sovereign God that you are. Today, Lord, we ask thy Holy Spirit to take over and Lord, as we differ in faces, Lord, we differ in so many, so many different needs. So Lord, we ask that you, you who know each one of us by the, you know the number of the hairs on our head. But because you know us so intent, Lord, we ask that you, the great physician, take out your prescription pad and write a prescription for each and every one of us today. Lord, I also want to add in my prayer today is that we want to give you a gratitude of praise of just saying thank you for your protection. Thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. Right now, Lord, we just ask that you give us that word that was going to draw us closer to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Partnering with the promises of God. Matthew 25, verses 34 and 40. It reads like this. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. 
I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and, and gave you something to drink, or str a stranger and showed you hospitality, or naked and gave you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I'll tell you the truth. When you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Since the plague of the coronavirus, it has caused devastating effects on lives of millions of people around the world. Sickness, death, high levels of stress. It has impacted our education system, unemployment, elevated economic crisis around the world, and the list goes on and on. But despite the devastating effects of COVID-19 has caused it has caused to our world, yet it has done some good. It has brought out the good in the majority of all of us. Family members now and friends are checking on the elderly more than they've done before. People are finding creative ways of communicating with each other. We have found a greater appreciation for those in the health profession. And I want to say we're praying for you every day, all of you on the front lines. The crime rate has dropped around the world. But in the midst of this pandemic, pandemic, a wealth of people are displaying a genuine concern for one another. All of those in the health and public services, this verse comes to my mind for each and every one of you. It is found John, the 15th chapter, and the 13th verse, and it reads from the NLT, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. And I want to add a little bit to that. There's no one greater, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend or stranger. Major corporations and non-for-profit organizations are partnering together to assist those who have been impacted by the crisis. There are many churches that have stepped up to the front line in the middle of this storm, giving words of comfort and encouragement to many who are distressed. In addition to giving out food and clothing and other personal assistance, Going back to verse 40, it said, And the king will say, I tell you truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You might ask the question, what do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean about this king, and who is this king? Well, I want to establish it in verse 40 when it said, And the king said, who is the king? I want you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation 19. Let's look at Revelation 19. And in this chapter, it's describing the return of Jesus Christ in his mighty and his glorious power as he's coming back to earth to, take, to come and claim his children. But one thing I want to say that in verse nine, chapter 19, if you go down to verse 16, this is what it reads. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. You see, Jesus has proclaimed and he has earned the title of being the King of kings. So in Revelation, in what we're talking about here, it says that and the king, King Jesus, will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You were doing it for me. 
Let's look at Genesis 1, 27. I want to bring in a connection here. Jesus said, you were doing it unto me. How do you make that connection? You're doing it unto me. Well, let's look at Genesis 1, 27 and see what it says. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So in other words, what I'm looking at here this morning is that when God sees someone in a bad situation, when God sees somebody that may be shedding tears, when God sees somebody that is feeling helpless, when God sees somebody that is low in the food in their cupboard, when God sees these different situations, he doesn't just look at people and see people, God looks into the eyes of all of us and he sees his image in us. So when he looks at us, he sees himself. It's just like a parent. God takes the role as our parent, our heavenly father. But as parents, you know as well as I know, I'm a parent, I'm a father. And if someone does something to your child, you say to yourself, whatever you do to them, you're doing it to me. And that's the idea that God, t Jesus takes in this situation. He says, when I see someone in those situations, I see the image of myself. So when you give clothes to someone, when you give food to someone, you're giving it to Jesus. More and more, I begin to understand God's priorities. As God talks about this in, in, in Matthew, he talks about doing others and the fact that you're doing it unto him. I understand more and more about God's priority. And let me explain what I mean. When I look at Matthew 22, verses 36 and 39, it says a lot. Let's read it. Verse 36, teacher, which commandment is the greatest in the law? Someone's trying to challenge Christ in his intellect. But he responds back by saying this, Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This, he said, is the first and great commandment. But then he goes on, and this is what brings the priority connection here together. In verse 39, he said, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So God makes a quick connection of his priority of love. He said, you have to love me, your God, and love your fellow man. Now, I know right now, let me stop and make a clear, clear uh, clarification on this. There are some who do believe in the fact that it's all about love. Love, love God, love, 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 love. And if people feel that loving God, then he doesn't require any um, uh, responsible uh, or, or he doesn't require any consequences, that we don't, he doesn't require, I'm sorry, any consequences for our action. But God does require consequences for our action. He loves us, but yet God has a, has a guideline that we must follow in order to fall and to be closer and an image of his character. See, God cannot stand sin. God is separate from sin. But it's only because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and shedding his blood for you and I that has broken that wall down and has allowed us to be reconciled back with God. So there is a consequences for our action, but it doesn't do away with the ideal that love is the principle. Love is the foundation of God. God is love and love is God. They're both connected together. So God tells us that we must love him. And in order to love him, we have to love him in order to love each other. You can't have one without the other. And it makes me sort of, conf 
it, it concerns me a lot when we have so many people who claim to love God, but yet can have an ill feeling with a fellow man or, or, or sister. It, it really concerns me when we see individuals who study so much in the Word of God and study all the other uh, writings that God has put at our disposal, and yet with all the reading and all the writings and all the this and that, still yet they don't see the ideal that you have to have love for one another. You see, God tells us that this is what he calls that. See, if you can have all the knowledge in the world of the Bible, you can have all the gifts of speaking in tongues, you can have all the gifts that you want, but if you don't have the gift of love, you don't have anything. The Bible calls it like this. He says that you have a form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. And that power is the love of God. God so loved the world, he gave his son. And after Jesus left and he went away, God still loved us. He could have stopped there. He could have said, wait a minute. I've proven myself to you over and over again. I've given you evidence of my love for you over and over again. If you look in the Old Testament, you see where I, I parted the Red Sea for Daniel, I mean for Moses. I protected Daniel in the lion's den. And then I can fast forward and, and, and I can show you that I gave you my son and my son died and, and three days he was in the grave and he rose up again. And then after he rose, God could have told us that I've given you the evidence, so find out for yourselves. And if you make it to the end of the kingdom, I mean to, to, to the pearly gates, I'll see you there. If you don't, then that's fine too. But he didn't do that. Even after he gave his only begotten son, he gave us the Holy Spirit. And John 14, 26 says this, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Thank God for Jesus today and thank God for the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? I'm gonna break it in a practical sense here for you. The Holy Spirit is your GPS system. That stands for God protection, protective system. See, when you look at the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we find ourselves lost and we find ourselves that we've fallen off the beaten, the, the beaded path, it doesn't say necessarily in God's GPS reroute, it says, repent. And when we repent, then the Holy Spirit, it says it's a light unto my path. It'll give us that light and put us back on that track. And we'll be back on the path of righteousness again. The Holy Spirit displays the character of God. The Holy Spirit is our lighted pathway to God. And the Holy Spirit is the mirror that forever shows us the image of God. Matthew 5, 14 and 16 says this. He says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see, I love the idea where the Bible tells us that let your good deeds shine out for all to see because during this, this coronavirus that we're going through right now, don't you think for a moment that those that may be lost, those that may be hurting, those that may be in want or need, that they're not looking at the church to see what, how we're reacting in this crisis situation. Once the dust settles, we can't come out of the bushes and then come out and start proclaiming God's word when we hid in the time of crisis. So it's time to hold our light up to the world. 
It's time to show the world that our faith is in Jesus Christ. And it's time to show the world that the Bible says, they shall know that you're my disciple by the love we have for one another. Praise God. Someone said this to me the other day, and I thought it was something to think about. He said, Pastor, he said, tell me something. He said, do you think the Lord allowed this COVID-19 to take place in order to close the churches so that church members can now go outside the church and do ministry? I said to myself, well, I'm, I'm not going to say definitely that that's what God had in mind, but it does give us something to think about. It does let us know that our job just doesn't finish inside the walls. Oh, don't get me wrong, folks. We have to come, the Bible tells us, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And God gives us his sanctuary for our, our refueling stop. This is the time where we praise and, and give God the glory for all that he's done because he's, he's due all the honor and the glory. And when we come here, we sing praises to God and we pray to God and we, and we just come together and we encourage each other. We give testimonies that validate the faith in God that God is still the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. So no, we do need to come into the temple and praise God. But once that's over with, then there's another side of our service and our duty that we have to obey. And that is that we must take everything that we've learned, everything that we prayed about, everything that we've sung about, everything that we've just learned and embraced about God, we must take those characteristics and take those experiences and take them out to a world that's dying, a world full of darkness. Let someone out there know that there is hope for tomorrow. Better yet, there's hope for today. Let your light be the light that opens the door to God to come into their lives. Partner with the promises of God. When I look at verse 35 in our original text, it says, for I was hungry and you fed me. Well, then I look at Psalms 37, 25, and this is what it said. David said, I was, a young, I was young and now I'm old, and I yet never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. How do you partner with the promises of God? Well, just maybe that when God gives us that promise, maybe you are part of that promise by taking that bread and taking that water to a family. See, that's how we work together. God promises things and it's part of us to be a part or a partner with that promise. Can you say amen? Moving on to our next verse. It, it says part, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. Isaiah 58 and 11 tells us the Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. God wants us to take water to those that don't have water today. Oh, but we're bringing the, the text into context, and that is that the living water, the gospel of Jesus Christ, while we're giving the physical water, we can also usher in the living water, and both will allow us to be like an ever-flowing spring. The next part of the verse, it says, I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. Deuteronomy 15 and 11 tells us this, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother or your sister, to the needy and to the poor in your land. Now I want to stop right there for a minute. Sometimes we overanalyze some of the scriptures and we become too judgmental. I've heard a lot of people say that when individuals find themselves um, at the lowest point in their lives, or you may see someone on the street with a sign that says, I'm hungry. You may see those things, and some people have taken the idea that, well, I got my education. I work every day, so you need to do the same thing, and you don't deserve for me to give you anything. But see, 
If we flip that around and we look at what made us so good or so perfect, what gave us, allowed us to, to have the knowledge that we have, to have the job that we have, what gave us the, in, the unction to be able to get up and to work every day, who gave that to you? You didn't inherit that in and of yourself. God gave that to you. See, there was nothing you did that was so great or so grand or you looked so good or wonderful for the Lord to bless you with to have a very, very gifted mind. Some are doctors, some are lawyers. Everybody don't have those gifts. But what happens is when God gives out the gifts and talents to each and every one of us, there was nothing we did. He did it because of his grace and his mercy, and he gave each and every one of us. And sure enough, we're supposed to take those gifts and develop them. But God gave us the gift. What did we do to earn it? He gave it because of his grace and his mercy. So he tells us that the poor is going to be with you always. And see, you giving to the poor is only a mirror of how God gives to us unmerited grace and unmerited mercy. You see, the Lord lets the rain fall down on the just as well as the unjust. He lets his sun shine on the just as well as the unjust. God gives each and every one of us mercy and grace and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And when he gives that to us, I want to let you know there's nothing you did that was so great that allowed you to deserve God's grace and his mercy. So it mirrors to us when we see those that are less fortunate than we are to be able to give to the less fortunate. It's not for you and I to, de to determine why they're in the position they're in. But if God puts it on your heart to give to someone, then you do that. Now let me say this too. It's not... So God gives us common sense, and we must use that common sense. But if the Holy Spirit gives you an unction to pass on something to someone else, let me tell you this, it's not for you to judge or to, to scrutinize them to see what they're going to do with that, those funds. God told you to give it. You get the blessing from that. If that individual does something that's different than what he or she asked for, that's between them and God, and not you. So the poor will be with us always. In verse 36 in our opening scripture, uh, cha chapter there, Matthew, it says, I was naked and you gave me clothing. Luke 3 and 1, 11 says, John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. Then he goes on next, he said, I was sick and you cared for me. James 5 and 14 tells us this, is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now I'm not telling you that we as elders and pastors that we're supposed to take the place of our health profession, but there does come a time when God will lead us to come and pray for someone and we will pray for them. And I've seen people recover. Then there's other times when the doctor has turned his head and said, there's nothing else we can do. And I've seen prayers, and I've experienced that prayer where someone was on their dying bed, someone was in hospice, and a prayer was made, and God came in and he answered that prayer. We move on in that verse. It says, I was in prison and you visited me. Hebrews 13 and 3, it says, Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. We're talking about partnering with the promises of God. This is our duty to take the pages of the word of God from the songs of our praise, from the message of our sermons, from fervent prayers we've uttered in faith. Put these experiences together and share them in our families, share them in our households, around, and share them in our churches, share them in our communities, share just, just share it wherever you may go. Share that experience with others. 
Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The world will see the image of the Father through us when we're partnering with the promises of God. See, you and I can turn someone's trial into a testimony. You see, we live in a world of suffering and sorrow and chemotherapy and cancer and poverty and disease and accidents and drugs and deformities and, 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 and homelessness and broken hearts. And, and we cry out to God sometimes, does God, do you really care about what's going on in our lives today? What about this coronavirus? Lord, where are you? Do you even care? But Jesus has a response for us today. And he says, I suffered pain. I hung on a cross. I know what it's like. I know what it feels to have pain and sorrow. He said, I know what it feels like to have your family turn their back on you. I know what it feels like to have your friends turn their back on you. I know what it feels like when you've helped someone else and now that you need their help, they turn their back on you. He said, I know what pain and suffering is. I've experienced it. The Bible tells us, is the servant greater than the master? That's why the Lord is so connected with each and every one of us today here because he's experienced all the trials and tribulations that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, the song says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer because we can go to God who will stop what he's doing and he'll come down and he'll listen to your prayer. He'll hear every word. He's concerned about your trials and your tribulations, no matter how big or how small it is. <clears throat> God is right there willing to, to tend to our every needs. But we're living in a world of sin, folks, and sin has to play itself out. God is waiting for you and I and others to go out and preach this gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. He's waiting for us to go out and not just embrace the praise to ourselves, but he wants us to go out and share this word to the world, to your neighbor, to your community, and share the word in action. Make friends, build a relationship with people. Tend to someone's a need right there that's right in your face, right there. Don't just always say to somebody, oh, I'll pray for you. And they're telling you that they don't have any food in their house. Oh, I'll pray for you. It's time to partner in the promising promises of God during those kind of situations. You give to help somebody else. If you have one, two loaves of bread, give them the other loaf. <coughs> and God will show his face. God will try it. Step out on faith. Step out on faith and see won't God provide for you. We cry out, God, don't you care? But like I said, Jesus suffers those pains. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Isaiah 49 and 15. This is what the Lord tells us. He says, surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. You see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. See, the Lord, when we make it to heaven, you know, we're going to have a, a perfect body. Perfect, flawless but the Bible tells me, and the inspired writer tells me, that Jesus will, will, will bear having the scars on his hands throughout eternity. But it's not a deformity on his hands. 
When he looks at his hands, he'll show you just how great God is. People won't look, the, the, the saints of God, I know, won't look at those as scars. They'll look at those as holy reminders of how much and just how much God loves us. When you suffer arthritis, Jesus knows what you're going through. When you're lonely, he knows what you're going through. When you've been betrayed, he knows what you're going through. From the cross, Jesus speaks those who are suffering and, he, and those who have emotional problems and those who have physical problems. Jesus says, I understand your suffering. You see, it was a dark, dark Friday when Jesus was on the cross. It was a dark Friday when the birds stopped their singing on Friday. It was dark when the flowers drooped their heads on Friday. It was dark when the earthquake on Friday. It was dark when the thunder clapped and the rain fell on Friday. Judas betrayed him on a Friday. Peter forsook him on a Friday. They hung him on a cross on a dark, dark Friday. But thank God, that day that Jesus was in the grave was on a holy Sabbath day. The world was silent. Birds, like I said, stopped singing. They were silent. Christ was resting peacefully in the tomb. And it seemed that God was silent on the Sabbath day. But thank God, Sunday morning came. The Bible tells us an angel comes down. Matthew 28, verses 2, 3, and 6, it describes the resurrection. It says, an angel of the Lord descended from the heaven. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The angel answered, do not be afraid to the ladies that were there. He is not here, for he is risen. The glorious angels came down and spoke to the women at the tomb. The angel said, don't be afraid. He made a comeback from the death. The devil thought he had him, but Jesus made a comeback from his death. So he said, don't be afraid. He's not here. He's risen. If Christ can make a comeback from death, you and I can make a comeback. You can make a comeback from devastation of a divorce. You can make a comeback in the face of cancer. You can make a comeback from financial difficulty. You can make a comeback from a heartache, a, a sorrow, from serious illness and hardships and unemployment, from drugs and alcoholism, from the complete lack of spirituality. Everything in your life you can make a comeback from. The resurrection of Christ does more than just understand. He says, I want to change your life. See, Jesus understands and, and he imparts the strength to meet our needs. He gives us the strength to meet our needs. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, folks, whether you know it or not, there is a battle waging in the universe between good and evil. There's a battle that's wage, waging over your mind and my mind. But Christianity is not just a good ideal. Christianity is a life of Christ and is changing our lives and it changes everything about us. One day this Christ will put an end to this war. One day, that he will end the conflict between good and evil. Christ will fulfill heaven's, res heaven's rescue plan. He will return to finally destroy Satan 
to redeem the planet he rescued. Revelation 19, 11, 14, and 16 says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Finally, Jesus with, you have to visualize this scene here. Finally, Jesus with 10,000 times, 10,000 angels, the righteous angels, dazzling glory streams down from the sky. Satan is defeated, earth is made new, the Garden of Eden covers earth again, and the sequence of events begin that finally, completely, totally destroys Satan. Jesus asks you and me today, whose side are you on? Jesus invites you and me to make the, this choice. And the choice he's asking us to make today is to partner with him in a promise to live eternally. Let us pray. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you've given us. Lord, someone needs you right now, Heavenly Father. Someone is just barely holding on. But I want to remind them that you don't fail, Lord. You don't lie. You can't lie. So if we just embrace the promises that you've given us, and you've given us promises from Genesis to Revelation, and your promises that you would never leave us or forsake us, and you do understand what we're going through, and the sicknesses that we endure on this earth, death that we experience on this earth. All of those things are not brought on by you, Lord. You love us too much. You gave us your son to die for our sins. It doesn't make sense for you to cause problems in our lives. It's the devil that causes these problems and it's sin that causes the problems that we have to endure. But you said in your word to, to David, you said, weeping may endure for a night, but there will be joy in the morning. Lord, I ask right now, if someone wants to give their life to you, let them respond in a way that reach out. Someone's praying for them right now. Someone may want a Bible study. Someone just might want someone just to pray and comfort and talk with them for comfort. Whatever the case may be, I ask anyone that's listening this morning to just reach out and someone will respond to you. You can ask God to, to come into your life right now, Christ to come into your life right now with no one around you and he won't hesitate. And then if you live in our zip code area, 30094, I'm sorry, 30035 or 30025, Greater Atlanta, 30035 or Newton County in the 30025 area, just reach out to one of the churches and, and, and we'll respond. We'll respond. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen.
thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of our worship service. I hope you were blessed. I know I was blessed today. Now here's a time where you can bless others. If you go to the Greater Atlanta Seventh-day Adventist Church website, look in the top right-hand corner, you will see three lines. Click on that line and it will navigate you to our online giving tab. If you go to Newton County Seventh-day Adventist Church website, at the top of the website itself, it will have an online giving tab. Click on that tab and you can be a blessing to someone else. Thank you and God bless you. treasure hunters happy sabbath amari uh, and i are about to go on another big adventure and every explorer needs the right tools to search so let's see what we have all righty we have a flashlight which will help us light our path and we have our trusty compass, and the compass will help us find our direction. And of course, we of course we have our binoculars. Now we need the binoculars to help us focus in and see things clearly. And finally, we have our shovel, and our shovel will help us dig into the dirt as deep as we need to go. I believe that's the end of the tools, Amari. Are you sure that's all of the tools? Well, yeah, that's all the tools I see. You think we need something else? Yeah, we're forgetting about the map. <gasps> that's right, the map. And I have it right here. No, not that map. No? This map. The Bible. You are absolutely correct, Amari. And now that we have the right map, we can see just where we're going in our treasure today. Let's have a closer look. A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Take a look, my friend. <laughs> Someday it'll all be mine. Don't forget your brother. What does Micah have to do with it? I'm the oldest. The oldest gets everything. Not if he isn't worthy. Are you saying I'm not worthy? I'm only saying... It'll all be mine someday. <laughs> you watch. Today we harvest. Wake, my sons. The fruit is ready to be picked. Well, they're already up and gone. What? If we don't pick it today, the whole harvest is lost. And I'm too weak to do it myself. You start. I'll find the boys. Y yes, Josh. <laughs> 
sell a few of these and I'll be my own master. No more planting, picking, and weeding for me. Until that time comes, I need your hands at home. It's harvest day. Oh, Father. Come, before it's too late. But I... I... Enough, Micah. Come. I'm staying here. Say that again? I'm sick and tired of the vineyard. It's all I ever do. And what does Joachim do but play all day long and brag about the time when it'll all be his? Well, he can have it. I'm finished. Don't you have anything better to do than watch me work? <laughs> Not that I can recall. Well then, here comes your father to jog your memory. Joachim, it is harvest day. I I'm sorry, father. So you always say. And yet I'm always hunting for you when there's work to be done. Oh, I I'll come right away, father. I promise. See that you do, or we'll lose the harvest. You're not going? Father gets excited sometimes, but the job always gets done whether I go or not. Relax. Oh, we won't even finish half of it at this rate. It's a horrible loss. Yes, so much fruit. Not the fruit, the respect of my sons. Father, I'm sorry, Father. It was wrong how I talked to you. I'm here to work if you'll forgive me. All is forgiven and forgotten. Looks like I came back just in time. I have something to tell you, Micah. I don't think I'll live much longer. I want you to inherit this vineyard. I don't want to take anything from Joachim, Father. You haven't. Joachim expected it to be his just because he was the oldest. But you have always been here, whether you liked it or not. My vineyard is yours.